Sony now has four different full frame cameras that all share the same sensor and overall image quality. So obviously you should just buy whichever one's cheapest. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Nick with b &H. Stay create. I'm sorry? Oh, uh, I've just been told that there's actually more nuance to it than that and to do an in-depth video explaining the differences and similarities between these cameras. The a7S III, FX6, FX3, and ZV-E1 may all share a sensor, but the actual cameras surrounding that sensor are all tailored to very different workflows, and depending on your needs or level of experience, one is likely to be better suited to you than another. We're gonna break down what all these cameras offer independently, and then see how they stack up for specific shooting situations head-to-head. -head. Now, we've done in-depth overviews of all these cameras at the time of their release, so check the notes below for links to those videos. But before we compare their specific features, let's do a quick sort of speed dating round of what they all offer independently. The a7S III is a hybrid camera with a 12.1 megapixel XMAR R BSI CMOS sensor. You're getting a high resolution EVF for photos, a tilty flippy screen, and some seriously impressive video specs. In a speed editing context, this one is open to a little bit of everything. The FX6 is a dedicated cinema camera with the same sensor, but with tons of video focus dedicated buttons and features such as timecode support and built-in ND filters. This one is looking for serious commitment only. The FX3 kind of splits the difference between these two, being a smaller hybrid camera like the a7S III, but offering some of the features you get in the FX6, such as timecode support via adapter, as well as XLR mic support via an included handle. This one knows what it wants, but it's open to try new things. And finally, the ZV-E1 is also a hybrid camera that shares many of the specs found in the FX3 and A7S III, only with a new dedicated AI processor that enables things like smart reframing and dynamic active image stabilization. Compared to the other three, I don't know, this one's mainly looking for a good time. So we'll start this comparison broadly by comparing image quality. Now for this test, every single camera has been set to the exact same settings and with the exact same color grade applied. And as you can see, the image quality looks excellent. The 10 bit 422 S-Log3 profile provides a ton of dynamic range and latitude to grade your image. And all four cameras also offer the ability to shoot at high frame rates of up to 4K 120 frames per second with full autofocus support and only a minimal crop applied. Once again, since all four cameras share the exact same sensor, this result is unsurprising. But considering these cameras cover a price range from around, at the time of this recording, $2,000 to $6,000, it is important to emphasize that you're getting excellent and pretty much exactly the same video quality across the board. But what about photo quality? So this is where the first major differences kind of start to appear. Because while the XMOR sensor means that photo quality will be the same across the cameras, not all cameras here are even able to take pictures. Being a dedicated cinema camera, the FX6 is a video only camera with that 12.1 megapixel sensor, a 10.2 megapixel effective one for 4K video. So if you're looking for a true hybrid camera, you're gonna wanna look at the other three options here. The ZV-E1, A7S III, and FX3 are all able to take 12 megapixel images. While this resolution may be on the low end compared to many other hybrid cameras, for web deliverables and social media, it's still a great option. And once again, the sharpness and color detail is excellent across the board. But while these three can all take stills, only the A7S III has a dedicated EVF and mechanical shutter option, and it's able to shoot at up to 10 frames per second in RAW or JPEG. So while all three of these guys are, you could safely say, video-centric hybrid cameras that can also take still images, if you have a strong interest in photography, the A7S III is going to be the most fully featured. All right, we covered the broad strokes, so let's get into the nitty gritty. The A7S III, as we've already discussed a little bit, is the most hybrid camera out of all of these. You're getting a traditional mirrorless body design that can take excellent, albeit low resolution, still images, and you can do it through an incredibly high resolution 9.44 million dot EVF. And not only can it record video at 4K 120 and 1080p at 240 frames per second in 10-bit 422, but it doesn't have a record limit for any of these modes. And with an Atomos Ninja, you can also output 16-bit RAW to an external recorder via its full-sized HDMI port. Now the FX3 here does lack the EVF and the mechanical shutter that you get in the A7S III, but otherwise it features the exact same specs I just mentioned and it actually makes up for it with some more video-centric features. It includes the Cine EI profile found in Sony's cinema line of cameras for maximizing highlights and shadow recovery in post. It also features XLR support via an included top handle, allowing you to easily record high quality audio from professional shotgun or lab mics directly into the camera. Finally, it includes timecode adapter support for easily syncing audio in post from multiple sources, and tons of quarter 20 UNC screws for mounting accessories without necessarily needing to get a cage. 
Now the FX6 here being a dedicated cinema camera obviously goes all in on the video features. Same ISO, color profiles, resolution, and frame rate options as the FX3, but as you can clearly see, a lot more IO options and dedicated buttons. The biggest one is probably the built-in seven stop ND filter, which essentially slaps a pair of sunglasses onto your camera and allows you to adjust your exposure without having to touch your ISO, aperture, or shutter speed. But not only that, it's an electronically variable one, meaning you can dial in your other settings and then when moving between light areas and dark areas, the FX6 can smoothly apply and remove the ND filters automatically. You're also getting a ton of IO options, including, but not limited to, two XLR inputs via its handle, USB-C, BNC timecode, HDMI and SDI output, an external and remountable touchscreen, and support for Sony BP batteries for truly excellent battery life. Finally, there's the ZV-E1, which despite sharing most of the specs as the FX3, is marketed by Sony as a vlogging camera. Now this might sound weird at first, but there's definitely a reason for this. The ZV-E1 has the same photography modes and, pending a firmware update coming soon, the exact same video specs as the FX3, only in an even more compact body. But where it mainly differs is with its beginner and content creator friendly features, such as dedicated background defocus and product showcase buttons, quick menu options, and vlogging modes such as cinematic vlog. But it also has a dedicated AI processor that enables cool features like smart reframe, multiple face recognition, and dynamic active electronic image stabilization. Now, before we show you all these head to head in a few different shooting situations, we're going to be doing the first and possibly last official b and feature, feature set lightning round. Lightning round. <laughs> we are going to be answering these questions, I don't know, here, and simply answering yes or no as to which cameras have them, starting with, can it take pictures? That is going to be a yes for the FX3, ZV-E1, and A7S III. And as a little bonus, with a viewfinder and a mechanical shutter, that is going to be a yes for the A7S III only. Does it have the option for XLR inputs? That's a yes for the FX6 and FX3. Both include a top handle, and if you have that connected, you're able to plug in XLR microphones such as shotgun mics or high-end lav mics. Does it have five axis and electronic image stabilization? That is going to be a yes for the FX3, ZV-E1, and A7S III. Like most cinema cameras, the FX6 does not have any sort of electronic or five axis image stabilization. Does it include built-in ND filters that are also electronically variable? That's gonna be a yes for the FX6 alone. For any other camera, you're gonna to want to bring your own ND filters to put onto your lenses. Does it have the all important tilty flippy screen? That is a yes for the FX3, ZV-E1, and A7S III. Although in a technicality, you could say that you could jerry-rig the one that the FX6 comes with to flip around to show you, but it's not really easily designed for that. Does it include dual car slots with an SD and CF Express Type A support? That's a yes for the FX3, FX6, and A7S III. On the ZV-E1, you're limited to a single SD card slot. Does it include fully unlimited recording? That's a yes for the FX3, FX6, and A7S III. On the ZV-E1, you're limited to about 30 minutes in 4K. Does it include raw output support and a full-size HDMI? Once again, that is a yes for the FX3, the FX6, and the A7S III. On the ZV-E1, you're limited to what you can record internally and you don't get a full-size HDMI port on it. Uh, chugging along, does it include timecode support for pro video shoots? Once again, that's a yes for the FX3 and FX6. The FX6 has BNC timecode built into it, whereas the FX3 you can get through an adapter, so they will both support it. Does it include SDI out? That is a feature that the FX6 has and the FX6 alone. So if you wanna do any sort of SDI input and output, FX6 is your best option. And finally, does it have webcam functionality? That is going to be the FX3, the A7S III, and the ZV-E1. You can't really use the FX6 as a webcam without using a capture card of some kind, whereas these guys, you can use it right out of the box. So we're here in our peer space for the day. We have all these cameras here and the goal is to kind of see how they all work in a simulated professional shoot. So we have the fully rigged out FX6 here, the moderately rigged out FX3, ZV-E1, and A7S III. And what we're really testing here is just what the shooting experience is like on all these cameras, because shooting experience is not something you can really put onto a spec sheet. It's kind of difficult to explain like how easy or how difficult something is when you're actually in the thick of a video shoot. Now, so far, we've just been shooting some static shots. We're mostly just comparing what the image quality looks like. 
And obviously I'll have to take it back and take a look at it in DaVinci Resolve in order to see if there's any like subtle differences. But just looking at it right here, it looks very similar, which once again should be unsurprising. They have the exact same sensor. And also just for the sake of consistency, we did put the exact same 24 to 70 millimeter Sony lens on all of these guys. So we should be getting very comparable image quality. Now, a couple quick observations I've had so far. I like the much more blatant tally lamp you get on the FX3 and the FX6. You do get an indicator that you are recording on these two as well, the ZV-E1 and the A7S3. It's just really nice to get super visual confirmation. And it's especially noticeable when you're looking at all the cameras like I am in a semicircle in front of me. So that's really nice. Also, uh, the menu systems. For the most part, the ZV-E1, <laughs> Sony, all your cameras, they just blur together. A7S III, ZV-E1, and FX3 all essentially have the same menu system, but the FX6 here, completely different menu system. It is Sony's professional video menu system, and it's a little tricky at first because you do have a menu button, you tap it once and it gives you a quick menu, and then you press and hold it and it kind of unlocks the full menu system that you can get on the camera. Um, now, the other thing about the FX6 you'll notice here is we have really rigged this out. We could absolutely strip this down. The camera itself is actually pretty lightweight considering its size, um, but you'll notice we have a pretty chunky lens on it, and then instead of using the BP battery that it comes with, we have mounted a V-mount battery to get longer battery life. We've attached the top handle with the XLR input if we wanted to use that. We have the external monitor. We have the, I'm gonna turn this very, very slowly. Uh, we have the side handle that comes with it as well, which is really handy to navigate the menu and just stop and start recording. So this has been fully rigged out, but just, j just as this is rigged out and you can strip it down, you could absolutely get a cage for the ZV-E1 or the A7S III here if you do want to use it in a more professional video shooting mode. So there's definitely a lot more we wanna test here today. We wanna to test some of the in-body image stabilization on these guys and see how it compares to the FX6, which does not have image stabilization. We're gonna put these on the gimbals and we're gonna see how it all looks. So we just did some shooting with these cameras to test out different forms of stabilization, just to kind of give you an overview of what your options would be for stabilizing your footage with these guys. Now, starting with this guy, the Chunky Boy, the FX6, you don't have as many options for built-in image stabilization as you do on the other ones. As a cinema camera, it's primarily designed to be rigged up to either like a steady cam or a gimbal, or they assume you're using it handheld. You do have some options though, like if you wanted to pair a lens with stabilization in it, or if you wanted to take the footage you shot and put it in Sony's Catalyst software, which can read the metadata and then stabilize it in your editing software. You could do something like that. But the other guys here do have built-in IBIS and electronic image stabilization. So the FX3 here and the A7S3 are gonna give you that. And then the ZV-E1 gives you that, but then on top of that, it also has dynamic active mode, which uses its AI chip to boost the stabilization that you would get on the other guys and provide even more image stabilization. So that's kind of the options that you get with these. Now to test it, we decided to kind of give you a little bit of everything. We didn't have the time to rig every single camera up every single way, but on the FX6, we just shot handheld. On the FX3, we did turn on just the standard image stabilization on this guy. On the ZV-E1, we turned on the dynamic active mode. And then on the A7S3, we turned the stabilization off and we put it on a gimbal. Now, obviously, despite what marketing will tell you, no camera image stabilization is gonna be truly gimbal-like, at least not right now, maybe someday in the future. So if you're shooting handheld, the goal should not be to expect it to look like a gimbal. Gimbal stabilization is one thing, handheld stabilization is, is another. When you look at the results of what we shot here, you shouldn't try to think of it as like how close to each other do they look. It's just to show you the different forms of stabilization you can get on these cameras. Now, as an example, like we shot with the FX6 completely handheld. You could still strip this down and put it on a gimbal and get truly smooth footage if you want to. But if you do rig it out like this and you have enough weight, you can kind of counterbalance those micro jitters. So the footage, it looks handheld and there is some shake to it, but it doesn't get that sort of gross micro jitteriness that you would get on a small mirrorless camera. 
Now, not to call these guys out, but small mirrorless bodies like this are a little bit trickier to shoot stable footage with, and that's why the image stabilization on these guys is so important. It almost gets you to the point of what it would look like if you were shooting on a heavier cinema camera. So you're getting different stabilization options with all these cameras. You can put any one of them on a gimbal if you want that look. And you can also get smooth handheld footage if you want with them. It's just a matter of what your workflow is, what your priorities are, and how much you want to rig it up, to be honest. So we're now here in our studio to see how these cameras stack up against each other in a more content creator, YouTuber sort of setup. I'm pretty sure this is the most cameras I've ever had pointed at me in my life. But what we are mainly gonna do is just see how usable they are. Once again, it's kind of difficult to see on a spec sheet how easy they're going to be for your setup. And I think the camera we gotta start with is the FX6. It's kind of the one that sticks out the most. Now, you'll notice right off the bat, this is the only camera that is on a full-size tripod. And that is because while it's pretty lightweight for a cinema camera, it is still not able to be mounted on like a tabletop tripod, which you will notice the FX6 here, A7S III and ZV-E1, they can all be mounted on tabletop tripods. So if space is a big issue, keep this in mind because this you can put on your desk, whereas the FX6, you're going to have to have a tripod or some other sort of rig. Now I will also say these guys, they all have the Sony 24 to 70 millimeter lens, which is a little bit heavy. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend putting a really big lens on these cameras if you're going to use them uh, kind of like I have them set up. So <laughs> don't do what I'm doing. Uh, I would just advise, make sure your camera is stable when you're shooting. Uh, but that being said, the FX6 actually did pleasantly surprise me a little bit in that one of the most important things when you're in a sort of content creator setup is the ability to frame yourself, the ability to have some sort of tilty flippy screen so that you can make sure that you are in focus, that you're in the shot. Now, the other three cameras here have this. It's pretty much the exact same screen. It looks great across the board. The FX6 does have the screen here, which is about the same size, but you can mount it to different points on either the camera body or the top handle. And I was actually kind of able to jerry-rig it like you see here and flip the screen towards me. And actually, in relation to the camera body, this one actually stands out the most. So I can technically see myself a little bit better than I could on these guys, just because I can get the screen close to my head. But keep in mind with these other cameras, like the FX3, the A7S III, and the ZV-E1, if I need to go into a selfie mode, I just flip the screen, it's very easy. With the FX6, you have to actually unscrew it and mount it again. So it's gonna be a little bit more cumbersome. You can obviously do it in a pinch, but it's probably not gonna be ideal. Um, and also the FX6 is the only one here that you can't just plug in to use as a webcam. So if you wanted to do any streaming or truly just use your camera as a webcam, it's gonna work right out of the box with these other three cameras, but the FX6, not so much. Now, starting with the FX3 and the A7S III, for this specific type of shooting setup, they kind of perfectly overlap in terms of features. You will be fine with either of these because they have the same shooting modes, they have the same recording options, pretty similar body size as well. The fact that Sony advertises the FX3 as a cinema camera, but it's still so small and portable, like just a standard mirrorless camera, is really, really nice. So that is an advantage that you have there. The other advantage that you have is that the FX3 also comes with a top handle similar to the FX6. So if you want, what it can do is work as an interface so you can get high quality XLR microphones and run those into the camera so that you don't need external recording that you have to sync up later. You can get really nice audio with the FX3 right out of the box. The only reason I don't have it on this is because I was worried that with the top handle on and with a microphone, I don't think this poor little tripod would be able to support it. So this is what the shooting setup looks like as stripped down as you can get. Uh, once again, the A7S III, the main advantage you're getting with this guy is that it has most, pretty much all of the same video specs as the FX3, but you're getting a little bit better photography specs. But in this specific setup, you're gonna be fine with either of them. They're both excellent. Uh, however, the ZV-E1 here is actually probably the best suited for this specific type of shooting environment. Because first off, uh, if you are a beginner, this one has a lot of quick menu options that make it very easy to quickly get the kind of look you're going for. Whereas these other three cameras kind of require you to at least have a foundation of shooting video in order to get what you want. The other advantage is that the ZV-E1 has got all the AI boosted functionality that the other cameras don't have. So it can do things like reframe you within the shot where it will crop in 
And as you move around, it will keep you centered in the frame and make your shots look a lot more dynamic and interesting if you are shooting solo. These other cameras don't have that functionality. Another advantage the ZV-E1 has is that it has the best built-in microphones out of all these cameras. With these other three, the assumption is that you're only gonna use the built-in audio as scratch audio, whereas on the ZV-E1, you actually get perfectly usable audio out of it. Now the ZV-E1 does still have some disadvantages compared to the other three. Like these three all have dual card slots so you can either record backups or you can just relay record for a very long time. But most of those drawbacks aren't as noticeable in this type of shooting situation. I think most content creators would rather have the better audio, the more portable camera body, the AI functionality that the ZV-E1 has over dual card recording or time code support, let's say. To kind of summarize, the ZV-E1 really thrives in this specific environment. It's kind of what this camera was made for. The A7S III and FX3 are great sort of all-rounders. They can lean into the advantages of being smaller and more portable and having the tilty flippy screen while still having some more professional video features. Whereas the FX6, it's not that you would need to buy another camera if you also want to do content creation in addition to professional video, but it is not the best suited for this. It will work in a pinch if you need it to, as you can see here, but it's gonna be bigger, it's gonna take up more space, and you're gonna to need to kind of work around some of its design philosophy in order to get the best results out of it. So what have we learned from all this? Well, we mainly only covered two very specific shooting situations, a content creator focused one and a more professional client based one. I can confirm that both tasks are 100% doable on any of these cameras. But as you may have deduced, some had more friction than others. For the fully solo shoot, the ZV-E1 was the easiest to set up. The quick menu allowed me to get to settings easily. It's the smallest and lightest of the four and features like the product showcase mode and smart reframing allow you to get much more dynamic looking footage than you would otherwise be able to get on your own. And while they lack the AI boosted features, the A7S III and FX3 were not far behind in terms of usability. They both have the same tilty flippy screen and the same excellent autofocus with the added benefit of dual card slots to either record long form, because remember the ZV-E1 can only do about 30 minutes in 4K on a single SD card, or record to both cards at the same time for redundancy. And while you can finagle the FX6 screen to face juice so that you can technically shoot solo, its size and its weight really don't make it ideal compared to the other cameras. Plus, these other guys can also be used as webcams if you were interested in streaming, which the FX6 can't do without a capture card. When we moved to the professional shoot, however, there was a definite shift. The ZV-E1 held its own during the shoot in regards to image quality and overall usability, but for mission critical client work, you're likely not gonna wanna rely on the AI enhanced features it offers. Plus, only having one SD card slot can be a little nerve wracking. I personally never had an SD card fail on me during a shoot, knock on wood, but I'd also love to know that I'm getting a backup of everything to a second card. The A7S III and FX3 both address this concern, and not only can they get excellent video internally, but they can both record ProRes RAW to external recorders. And the FX3 specifically allowed us to mount our accessories much more easily, as well as shoot in the Cine EI profile to maximize the image quality out of the sensor. And while the FX6 lacks IBIS and stills functionality, it otherwise offered the most complete video shooting experience. When you're actually in the thick of a shoot, having all of your key functions mapped to physical buttons, like your ISO, your white balance, your gain level for mics, your S and Q modes, lets you move through your shoot much more quickly and easily. And having things like built-in electronically variable ND filters and built-in timecode and SDI output lets you do things with this camera right out of the box that you simply can't do with the other ones or else can't do without a lot more rigging out. It's very easy to just focus on the image quality you're able to get out of a camera when deciding which one to buy. But the tricky thing to tell just from a spec sheet is how easy the camera makes it for you to get that image. Across a range of usage cases, Sony makes a single sensor that can simultaneously be used for vloggers, content creators, documentary and narrative filmmakers, streamers, client projects, commercial work, and in between all that, take a few pictures. And if some of you are wondering where the FX30 sits in this whole lineup, we do have an upcoming video all about this Super 35 version of the FX3, so make sure you're subscribed and you won't miss it. Hopefully this helped you narrow down which one of these cameras is best for you and your workflow, and if it did, let us know in the comments below and tell us which one you would get. Until the next head to head though, I am Nick with B&H. Stay creative.